Hello everybody and welcome to my channel. This is the second part in a series entitled What is Philosophy? In the previous video, I tried to explain what I hope to accomplish in this series. If you haven't watched it yet, I highly encourage you to do it so you can get a general idea about my aims and method. In fact, the best way to watch this entire series is by accessing the playlist I created for your convenience. In this way, you'll be able to follow my thoughts in the right order. I included a link in the description below. If you like what I'm doing here and wouldn't mind seeing other similar materials, please subscribe to this channel and allow its notifications so that you'll get my videos as soon as I'm posting them. I also included in the description below a link to my channel's manifesto where I explain the kind of subjects I hope to explore in the immediate and distant future. I cannot thank you enough for your willingness to join me in this journey through great ideas, authors, books, and works of art. I want to start our brief and introductory exploration of philosophy with an overview of the usual everyday meaning of the word. What I'll try to answer in this video is what do we mean when we say philosophy in our regular communications with one another? In the next video, I'll explain what philosophy means from an etymological perspective. That is to say, we'll look at the ancient Greek roots or origins of the word. For now, let's look at the meaning of philosophy in its more common uses. Here, I'd advise everybody to consult different dictionaries. The one I use the most here is the Merriam-Webster uh, English Dictionary. Uh, however, on my website, you'll find links to other dictionaries so you can analyze the relevant entries at your leisure. Specifically, there seem to be three distinct understandings of philosophy in our everyday language. The first one is philosophy represents the worldview of an individual or a group. Once again, Philosophy represents the worldview of an individual or a group. But what is a worldview and how does one come about it? In general, a worldview is a set of ideas, concepts, and attitudes which can be conscious or unconscious and which express fundamental beliefs. As you will see, there is more than one worldview. In fact, there may be as many worldviews out there as there are individual persons, communities, and countries. To better understand the connection between worldview and philosophy, allow me to offer a few examples. Example number one. No group or community could exist without a moral outlook. That is to say, without a more or less clear understanding of right and wrong, good and evil. Such commandments as you shall not kill or you shall not steal or you shall love your neighbor as yourself are not random. They claim that murder and theft are wrong to be punished whenever they occur. They also claim that doing everything possible for one's fellow human beings is commendable and exemplary. Being good is the right thing to do, whereas doing evil must be avoided at all costs. This is an expression of an ethical worldview and therefore a distinct philosophy. Example number two. The same can be said about religion. There are many worldviews that proclaim that there is one or more gods, that there is a fundamental connection between the world as we experience and know it and the divine and that we, humans, must pay an unconditional respect to that fact. There is also the opposite worldview, which is prevalent in most West European countries, namely that religion is pure superstition, that there is no such thing as God or gods, goddesses, angels, demons, and so on, that religious beliefs belong to an ignorant period of human history when we didn't have science and we had to rely on superstitious beliefs to explain the physical world around us. Now, this worldview says, when we know as much as we do about evolutionary biology, the physics of the atom, neuroscience, and cosmology, we cannot in good faith believe in the existence of God. These two attitudes toward the world are also two distinct 
philosophical positions. Example number three. The previous examples pertain to groups, communities, or society in general. Yet, I would say that at the personal level too, life is impossible without embracing a worldview of sorts. Now, it is very difficult for most of us to say exactly what our take on everything is. Still, our entire existence is based on some fundamental assumptions, such as life is meaning or life is meaningless. Or, no matter how bad things are, eventually everything's going to be okay. This would be the optimist position. Or, suffering, loneliness, and death are the undeniable and insurmountable facts of existence. That's what the pessimist usually claims. Regardless, if you look closely at your own life, you'll realize that everything you think, say, decide, and do is more or less based on comparable broad beliefs about existence and meaning. Most interestingly for me, to the extent that whether you know it or not, you live in accord with a worldview or another, you are, have been, and always will be a philosopher. And that makes me very, very proud. You should be too. The second definition of philosophy in its ordinary usage states that philosophy is a theory or generic view regarding a sphere of activity. Once again, a theory or generic view regarding a sphere of activity. Once more, let's take a few examples. The first example. Most companies today strive to be environmentally friendly. They take very seriously, in other words, the impact we humans have on the planet. We also hear that some institutions or organizations are committed to fairness and equality. Others, on the contrary, focus on merit only. Some companies prefer free trade. Others are against it. There are companies who provide high-end products and services. Others bet on the lowest prices for their customers. An organization or business can be pro-unions or contra-unions. In terms of profit, a company can be more shareholder-oriented or more employee-centered. These are just a few examples of what is usually called business models. But we can easily call them business or institutional philosophies. They are built upon and continually make use of a generic view regarding a sphere of human activity, in this case, the economy. The second example has to do with war. As you know, every country, like every single living organism on this planet, possesses a defense system. All modern nations have armies. Here, it is interesting to remember that armies are based not only on wealth, the number of soldiers, or technology. To a vast extent, they do. At the same time, armies, or their leaders, also embrace a definite philosophy of war. That is to say, there are military leaders or thinkers who believe that conflict resolution cannot dispense with aggressiveness and a display of force. The opposite camp states that, on the contrary, an army, no matter how strong, has to give way to diplomatic negotiations that any manifestation of violence cannot but worsen things and create even bigger conflicts. It may come as a surprise, but so far in human history, none of this philosophy has proved completely right. Yet philosophies they are, and to this day, they determine whether and how conflicts are solved. The last example here has to do with the country's view of justice and politics. Today, we live in a world which unconditionally believes that justice means individual human rights. However, it hasn't always been like that. In fact, until approximately 200 years ago, it was the collective, the tribe, the kingdom, the country, which mattered the most, while the needs and interests of the individual were totally subordinated to it. The same goes for democracy. Modern times seem to confirm the thesis that democracy is the most acceptable or the least harmful form of government. Yet, politically speaking, human history abounds in non-democratic types of government. For instance, tyranny, oligarchy, theocracy, absolute monarchy, or in more recent times, dictatorship. Every single one of these types expresses a generic view or philosophy 
regarding the judicial and political spheres of human activity. It's now time for the third and final definition. And here we return to the personal level. You've probably heard or read the word philosophy used in a following sense. Quote, you just have to be philosophical about losing some games because you can't win them all. End of quote. Interesting, isn't it? To define this particular meaning more precisely, I'd say that philosophy represents a psychological attitude of emotional calmness and non-resentful acceptance when faced with evil or misfortune. If you don't like my definition, here's how the Cambridge English Dictionary puts it. Quote, if you are philosophical in your reaction to something that is not satisfactory, you accept it calmly and without anger, understanding that failure and disappointment are a part of life. End of quote. In other words, when you are expected to behave philosophically, you must calmly accept and resign yourself to an unfortunate situation or a traumatic event. The same attitude of serene resignation is advisable in relation to one's fate and mortality. Please note that thus understood, philosophy is no different from psychotherapy, because it shows you a way to efficiently deal with pain, loss, frustration, and even death. Moreover, being philosophical in this sense implies knowing the limits of what one can and cannot do in a given circumstance. Third, philosophy appears as synonymous with wisdom. We'll take up this particular meaning in the next video where we'll discuss the ancient meaning of philosophy as love of wisdom. Thank you so much for watching and see you soon.